Yes. Okay. So, as I said, I'm Judith Winter, I'm Chair of Welcome Charity. Uh, really pleased to welcome you to what is our annual Marsden Lecture. I'm also really pleased to welcome you to Pairs Building. Um, this award winning building is one of the largest research, uh, immunology research institutes in the world. And everything that happens in this building centres around life saving and life changing treatments and cures into treatments um, of the human immune system. The Pairs Building is the Royal Free Charity's biggest project to date, and it's symbolic of the partnership between the Royal Free Charity, the Royal Free London, and UCL. And it's also symbolic of what can be achieved uh, at the intersection of visionary leadership in med medical research, health service delivery, and philanthropy. It's thanks to philanthropy that this building exists, and it's also thanks to philanthropy that the Royal Free Hospital exists. And some of you will know that just under 200 years ago, um, a local surgeon, William Marsden, preempted the introduction of the NHS by setting up a hospital free at the point of use. He was moved to act when he witnessed a young woman who died because she was refused access or refused um, admission to hospital because she couldn't afford treatment and determined that poverty should not be a barrier to accessing healthcare. William Marsden rallied his friends and colleagues um, and they contributed to the cost of what we know today as the Royal Free Hospital. Um, and I think William Marsden epitomised and was the pioneer of the philanthropic spirit that's the Royal Free. And tonight's event, the Marsden Lecture, is named in his honour. Um, the Royal Free Charity is delighted to hold this event um, on behalf of the Royal Free London NHS Foundation Trust. And every year we invite a guest speaker to um, explore the big issues at the heart of the healthcare system. And this year, however, we've invited two guest speakers um, because we believe that conversations around cancer should not be divorced from the patient experience. So I'd personally like to thank our two speakers, Professor Mike Richards and Dr Liz Reardon, for accepting our invitation to speak at our lecture this year. The um, annual <coughs> lecture is traditionally hosted by the medical director at the Royal Free, and soon we'll be hearing from Dr Julian Smith. But first I'd like to welcome this evening two of our distinguished former medical directors. So a big welcome to Professor uh, Sir Stephen Powis, um, who is NHS England's National Medical Director. Uh, Steve, we'd like to take this opportunity to congratulate you on your recent knighthood um, for your decades of commitment to the NHS and particularly for your role in leading the response to the pandemic. Um, I'd also like to welcome, I uh, can't see you Chris, Dr Chris Drever, there you are, um, who led the Royal Freeze response, medical response to the pandemic and is now the Medical Director for the NHS in London. And I must thank Chris on a personal note that we're extremely grateful for your continued support of the Royal Free Charity. Um, so I do hope that all of you this evening enjoy the lecture and um, I'm delighted to introduce Julian Smith who is the Interim Chief Medical Officer of the Royal Free London. Thank you. Thank you, Judy, and good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Royal Free London, I would like to thank you all for joining us this evening, whether you're watching online or here in the Paris building. If you are watching online, please feel free to put questions into the Q&A box during the talks, and we'll try and answer as many of them as possible later on. And if you are here with us in the Paris building, we're not expecting a fire drill, so if there is a fire alarm, please exit via the doors at the rear of the building. As many of you will know, the Royal Free London is one of the largest providers of cancer care in London. Undoubtedly, we've had many challenges in terms of our pandemic recovery. But we're in a position now where we ha have a real focus on cancer and the recovery from the pandemic in terms of what we're doing for our cancer patients. We've been really um, 
we've been really influenced by the, the pandemic um, to, to change the way that we work. And we've had to focus ever more closely on adapting to new and emerging technology, to working much more closely than ever before with our system partners, and also to really leveraging the support of the charity so that we can go further and faster than we would be able to do with NHS funding alone. And, and really in service of that, we're really focusing at the moment on increasing our activity levels and restoring them to above where we were pre-pandemic. And I think that's one of the reasons we're really so delighted to welcome our two guest speakers this evening to share their insights into cancer care. I'm going to hand over now to Professor Derylyn Hughes. As I say, we're really delighted we've got two guest speakers this evening to share their insights. And Derylyn is going to tell you a bit more about them. And Derylyn is our Director of Clinical Practice Groups, um, our Clinical Director of Research and Innovation, and also um, our Cancer Strategy Lead. Thank you, Derylyn. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, uh, Professor Sir Mike Richards. Uh, Sir Mike trained in oncology at Guy's Hospital before becoming an oncology at Arts before becoming an oncology consultant at Guy's, where he was the clinical director for cancer services and the Sainsbury Professor of Palliative Care. Sir Mike's name is a byword for cancer service development and improvement. And those of us working in cancer services know he's a passionate advocate for the view of patients and staff in those reviews. In uh, 1999, he was appointed the first National Cancer Director by the Department of Health. And he's led various strategic reviews which have led to real uh, enduring and meaningful changes in services for cancer patients, including the Cancer Plan, the cancer reform strategy and improving uh, cancer outcomes. And in 2013, he became CQC's first Chief Inspector of Hospitals. <coughs> so Mike has been a friend of NCL, uh, directly influencing the shape of our cancer services and our cancer alliance in North Central London, always with, uh, with great humour and uh, great generosity of his time. It's recently led two major reviews for NHS England, a review of adult screening services and a review of diagnostic <coughs> services. And in April 2022, he was appointed as chair of the UK National Screening Committee. So I'm delighted to invite you now to see. Darren, thank you very much indeed for that introduction. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's a huge pleasure and privilege uh, to be asked to give the Marsden Lecture. But why? Because William Marsden is actually one of my heroes, uh, and has been, I may say, for more than 25 years. Um, I don't have time to go into that, probably. But equally, because I think he is underappreciated in the country as well. Probably not in this room, um, but, but, but almost everywhere else. Um, and, and so, um, I think that, that's, that's why I was more than happy to accept this invitation. And if I could go on uh, to the, the next slide. The, one, the question that I want to pose this evening is, what would William Marsden think of the modern NHS? And in particular, of NHS healthcare. <coughs> and I'm only too delighted that there are some senior people from the NHS here um, that we can have this debate with. Because, as we all know, cancer was one of his interests, and of course, as you've heard, it's one of, of mine as well. So, let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, three parts to my talk, very briefly. Who was William Marsden? You've heard part of that already, but I want to reflect on some of the characteristics of William Marsden um, that would enable us to think what he might think about the current NHS. Then give you some very brief re reflections on the current state of the NHS, a slightly deeper dive into cancer care, but only slightly. Next slide, please. And 
I have to say, an awful lot of this I need to acknowledge a book called Search and Compassionate, um, which was written by a relative of his, Frieda Sandwith, um, in 1960. Um, and this gives me a, a lot of what I know about William Martin, but also a lot of the pictures that I'm going to, to, to show. Um, we can de debate, perhaps, whether it was a totally accurate picture of his life, but that, that, that's a, that, another matter. Um, and by the way, Surgeon Compassionate, yes, he was also a physician. Let me just be very clear about that. It took him longer to become a physician, because as we all know, it's much more difficult to become a physician. <laughs> so, I thought I'd, I'd stir, stir you up on that one. <laughs> um, anyway, let's go on to the next slide. So, born in 1796 in Sheffield, and this is his birthplace, um, and he had a uh, standard education, did quite well, and then trained uh, to be a druggist, which effectively is a pharmacist by today's uh, language. Um, but he was an ambitious young man, and that was not enough for him. His, his parents actually didn't want him to, to leave home, but he wanted to become a doctor. And he ran away to, to London. He got on a coach uh, down to London um, from the north. Um, and interestingly, it was on the coach that he met his future wife, um, he was 20, she was 12, but it was all about <laughs> uh, because it was a lot, lot later before they actually got, got married. Um, and um, so anyway, they both came down to, to London and then he found lodgings uh, in Holborn, so near the city, um, and uh, started working as an apothecary there. Um, and then from that, he actually also trained in anatomy. Um, and that was, of course, quite controversial in those days because to, to do dissection, uh, they had to dig up bodies and the so-called resurrectionists um, who were uh, involved. But, but he did. And having got his anatomy training, he was then accepted to the oldest hospital in London. Let's be clear about it. The next slide, please. Um, which is the Bartholomew's. It hasn't changed much since then, but there we are. Um, <laughs> I, I can say that I trained there. Um, and, um, but he then became a, a student of John Abernethy, who was one of the leading surgeons of his time. And he qualified a member of the Royal College of Surgeons uh, in 1827. So by that stage, he was uh, 31, I think. And then the famous story um, that comes next, with next slide, please, um, of uh, finding a woman dying of syphilis near uh, St. Andrew's Holborn. I don't suppose she really did look like this, um, but, um, but, but, but I believe that that picture actually belongs to the Royal Free, and, uh, and so I thought I'd better show it anyway. Um, and, and, but he clearly wanted to do his very best for her, um, and he tried to get her admitted, first of all, to Bart's, which was his own hospital where he um, was on the staff, uh, but he was not either a subscriber or uh, a governor. And, and so because of that, he did not have the right to admit her to the hospital. And that is absolutely critical to the story. Um, and he then tried to get her admitted, first of all, to Guy's. Next slide, please. Um, Guy's, it's quite interesting. It started its, its history about 100 years before this particular point where, where Marston was trying to get the woman admitted. Um, it started its history. It was, its name was Guy's Hospital for the Incurables. Um, but, and so at that point, they probably would have taken her in. But um, of course, over time, they had lost that title, and so she wasn't admitted there. Next slide, please. Um, and so they, they tried uh, St. Thomas's. If you don't recognize that as St. Thomas's, there's a very good reason. Uh, St. Thomas's in, in those days was where London Bridge Station now is. Um, it then moved uh, upriver to being opposite Parliament. Um, but they wouldn't take her either. So um, Marsden actually paid for her to be taken in um, by a widow who had a, an attic, and she died there, but he was not able to admit her to any of the major London hospitals at the time. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, this is the, the famous statement that in 1828, he convened a committee of 27 people to establish a free hospital, a hospital that you did not need a recommendation from either a subscriber or a governor. 
Um, and I rather like the name that it was, that it was given. The, the, the London General <coughs> Institute for the Gratuitous Care of Malignant Diseases. I'm rather glad that the, the name has now changed. Um, <laughs> but, but it's interesting quite how the word gratuitous is now thought of differently, as are malignant diseases, I think. So, um, but, and how was he able to do this? Because by this stage he was doing really quite well, and he was um, a freeman of the Worshipful Company of Cordwainers. Um, I'm almost prepared to ask people if they know what cordwainers are, um, but they were shoemakers. Um, and the, the, they're not cobblers. Cobblers only repair shoes. The cordwainers made new shoes. That was really very important. But, um, and it was, I think they had quite a lot of money behind them and were prepared to, to, to support him. So if we go on to the next slide, please, um, that leads to uh, the, the free hospital. Uh, as it became called very quickly, and unsurprisingly, it was really very popular with the poor. Uh, interestingly, right from the outset, it was supported by royal patrons. First of all, George IV and William IV. It was extremely unpopular with the medical profession. Um, and we'll come back to that. Um, that, that that's a, a constant. Um, it, 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 it had endless struggles raising funds, um, but Marsden doggedly kept at that. And then there were huge shenanigans uh, with, with staff, um, particularly around Frank's special solution. That was a quack medicine, and two of his doctors uh, endorsed it, and he vigorously opposed that. Um, and I think that shows his principles. Um, but that also led to fights with the medical profession more, more broadly. Anyway, despite that, it started off very small, just taking out patients, and then it had what were then called indoor patients, inpatients. But really importantly, it also took in patients with cholera, when there were cholera epidemics, which other hospitals were not, and it also took in people with sexually transmitted diseases, which other places were not. Um, and then quite quickly, uh, its name changed from that one I gave you before, and it became the London Free Hospital. And then as early as 1837, it became the Royal Free Hospital. It got, that was Queen Victoria, who had just come to the throne, and she made it a royal. And it's quite interesting, that was a lot quicker than the other hospital that he found. Um, I'm just saying. Um, so, um, and then, uh, next slide please. Uh, and this is uh, the, the, the hospital as it then was in the Grays Inn Road, um, and it had five wards, it had 152 beds, it had 300 outpatients a day, um, it then developed a, a medical school, and actually after Marsden's time, uh, but very importantly, uh, a school of medicine for women. So it did a really a huge amount of good. And just to show a couple more pictures of the, 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 this, the next slide please, um, those were the, the, the male outpatients, they segregated, even had outpatients, male and, and female. And then the next slide, please, the, those were uh, the female inpatients, which I think looked rather comfortable. I don't know if it was actually <laughs> like that, but um, not, not bad at all. So uh, that, that's really all I'm going to say about the Royal Free, uh, because I now want to return, next slide, please, um, to, to Betsy Ann. Uh, his beloved wife, who um, he was devoted to throughout her life, but she became unwell in her probably early 40s, I think, um, and took to her bed, and it's almost certain that what she had was ovarian cancer. Um, and she died in 1846. And I think he uh, was bereft for several years, but, but it took him uh, five years. Next slide, please. Um, until he convened another meeting, at this time at his own home, which was 65 degrees in the field, so he must have been doing quite well by then, I think. Um, and so he said, now gentlemen, I want to found a hospital for the treatment of cancer and for the study of the disease. For the present time, we know absolutely nothing about it. Um, so again, the friends rallied, um, initially it was an outpatient only facility, then it started taking in patients. Interestingly, Queen Victoria, having been very supportive of the free, um, initially declined to make uh, any donation to 
um, what again, lots of hospital, obviously, the, the cancer hospital. I'd be very intrigued to know who was advising her at that time. Because actually, when she said she wouldn't support it, uh, she said something about because cancer patients could be looked after in general hospitals. Um, and so she was supportive of the Brompton that was looking after consumption and uh, the Hampstead Hospital that was looking after fevers, but not uh, initially um, at, at the, the cancer hospital. She did actually relent by uh, a, few, a few years later. Anyway, next slide, please. Um, and if anybody knows the Fulham Road, that hasn't really changed very much. Then you can still spot this um, as, as the cancer hospital on the Fulham Road. And one of the things there was, that, and again, to make the contrast with uh, the, the free hospital, the Royal Free, um, was that fundraising went very easily. Um, and uh, <coughs> that was, a, I think, a major contrast with what it means for a different class of patient, maybe, who knows. And, but let's think about the medical profession. I could have the next slide, please. So, of course, I've read my BMJ editorials, as I'm sure other people in the room have, going back to 1860. <laughs> um, and and there, is, there is one in 1860 called Hospital Distress. And I'll just read a couple of lines at the start and then a few lines further on. The foreigner who looks into the advertising pages of the Times cannot fail to be struck with the apparently bankrupt condition of our London hospitals. Not much has changed. Um, and then if we could go to the next slide, if you take the third line there, let us ask, for instance, what possible necessity there is for the imposing looking building unfinished on the Fulham Road, the future cancer hospital. Is there anything in the treatment of this fell disease which requires its isolation from other surgical cases? Then I think this is a reference to St. Mark's, the next bit. What um, peculiarity is there again in the treatment of diseases of the rectum that a special hospital should be devoted to them? And if there is no reason in favour of such hospitals, independently of the scientific and educational evidence against them, there is the one great financial reason that they squander the means of the charitable. This was the, 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 in other words, the general hospitals really opposed them because they were going to take money away from them. Um, and that, that was the battle line, um, all about money. Anyway, I'm going to leave that bit of the story alone. If we go to the next slide, slide. I think what I want to do now is just to reflect on what actually the story does tell us about William Marsden. I mean, first of all, clearly he had love for his wife, and he had a son um, that he was devoted to as well. I think his compassion is absolutely clear in terms of both the, the poor and the sick. His persistence, endless fundraising. His vision, the, the need for better care, and better care for all. Um, his matter of principle, his opposition to quackery, um, even when that brought him into fights with, with other members of the medical establishment. But he was courageous too, he was not frightened to take them off. So it's with those characteristics that I want to think about how might he have thought, now this is all speculation at this point, um, how might he have thought about today's NHS. Can we have the next slide please? What about the, oh, no, that is it. That, no, but back, back, back another one from there, I think. What would, yes. Um, uh, yeah, better. Um, so, what would you think of the values of the NHS? I'm sure you would be hugely supportive, care free at the point of delivery and available to Paul. But he would be critical about the inequalities that there still are within healthcare. And we still do have an inverse care law. There was recently a report that funding for primary care, for example, is actually greater in areas of greater affluence, um, so, uh, uh, as opposed to where it might be most, most needed. What would you think about compassion in the NHS? I think he would be hugely supportive. And we know that that is shown by the vast majority of NHS staff. And certainly, I was fortunate enough when I was uh, Chief Inspector of Hospitals See an awful lot of different hospitals, huge compassion. Uh, there were, of course, exceptions, and there still are exceptions, but they are a tiny minority. Um, and of course, we've seen the best of the NHS, I think, through through the pandemic. 
What about his principles? I think he would be very strongly supportive because regulation is much stronger now than it was. We regulate providers of healthcare, that's the job of the CQC. Uh, we re regulate the products and we regulate uh, ad um, advertising as, as well. So I think, on, again, people try and get around that. Um, when I was at CQC, there were providers that would try and get away without being registered. We prosecuted them. We had the power to do that and we done well do. Um, and so I think you would be quite pleased about that. But, but then, can we go to the next slide, please? What would he uh, think about I, I cancer care? Well, I think what he would say is um, that we have come a long way in the last 170 years. That is undoubtedly true, hugely true. But he would also be saying we could do better. Um, and I want to just think of this under the four headings there. Um, what about attitudes to the cancer care, particularly going back a, a decade or, or, or two? What about survival rates? What about our diagnostic services, which is an area uh, which I am taking great interest in at the moment? And what about how long it takes people to be seen and treated? So if we take each one of those in turn and we go to the next slide. So, when I was a junior doctor, I um, was very influenced by a very charismatic um, oncologist, uh, Gordon Hamilton Fairley, and I decided I wanted to go into oncology. But I was talking to my then boss, who was a very, very distinguished gastroenterologist, and he said to me, why would you want to go into oncology? Don't they all die? Um, and that, but that was not just him, it was quite a prevalent feeling uh, in the medical profession. Um, and then a bit later in my in career, I was actually wanting to do research into whether delays in the diagnosis of cancer matter. Um, and I applied to the Department of Health for funding for this, um, and I got two peer-reviewed <coughs> reports. This is before I actually did the work, um, and, and one of them said, there's absolutely no point in researching delays in the diagnosis of a few months. We know those can't make any difference. Interestingly, the other peer reviewer said, there's no point in doing the research. We absolutely know that they would make a difference. So, so, and, and I went back to the Department of Health and said, that's why I want to do the research, to, to demonstrate it one way or another. And it was absolutely conclusive. There were 80 papers on the subject at that time, and 79 of them went in one direction. Um, that it did make a difference. Um, and then, when I'd become a consultant at Guy's, um, I used quite frequently to be phoned by uh, an oncologist in Canterbury. And he, he phoned me one day to say sh about a 32-year-old with breast cancer and asked my opinion about whether she should be given chemotherapy. And I said, well, has it spread to the lymph nodes? Uh, what's it look like under the microscope? How big is it? And this was his reply. Breast surgeons in Canterbury don't ex examine auxiliary lymph nodes, pathologists make grave breast cancers, and unfortunately, actually, the size of it wasn't even recorded in this case. Um, now, was that unique to Canterbury? And that was the question I next asked myself, and actually looked at data for the whole of the southeast of England through the Thames Cancer Registry. And the honest answer it was it wasn't unique. Um, and despite the fact that there had been guidelines published in the BNJ before this, um, Everybody seemed to be ignoring them. Uh, they seemed to think they knew best. I do think we have moved on a long way. So, so attitudes have changed. So the next thing is, we have the next slide. Um, what about the survival rate? And sometimes we hear that there's no problem with the survival rates because you can see it's, a, it's improving. I know this is a bit out of date, but it's a steady trend line. It may have taken a bit of a dip, we don't know yet, but, uh, with the pandemic but everything improving. That's the good news side of this, but let's have the next slide, um, which I'll take, take you through. These are international comparisons, um, and there are six different countries and six different cancers. Um, and what you can see, these are what happened in 2000 and now up to 2014. The good news bit of this uh, slide is that in all the countries and for all of those cancers, things were improving. That is undoubtedly true. The bad news part of this slide is that the UK is at the bottom end on each and every one of them. Um, and so, although we were improving, 
we really haven't narrowed the gap, with the possible exception of breast cancer, where I think we have narrowed the gap, um, but not eliminated it by that time. So can we be satisfied with where we are? Absolutely not. Um, while we, these are other countries, they are Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Canada, uh, Australia, as well as ourselves. They're countries of broadly similar wells, broadly similar health systems. And the fact is, we are doing worse than that. And we look very carefully at this. Uh, is it differences in our cancer registration? No. Actually, one of the major factors here is we diagnose people later. And, and the subsequent studies, and I won't go through them all in detail, they, they show that. And, and so that also got me interested, next slide please, in diagnostics, and that's what I'm working on at the moment. And if you look at the number of CT scanners we have, just as an example of things, in comparison with other countries, here we are in England in green, we are at the bottom of an international um, <laughs> table. And I think the other important thing on this slide is, if we were to get up even to the average for the OECD, we need to double our number of, of CT scans. We are now doing that. Um, we're on our way to doing it, at least. And I'm really pleased to say that over the last two years, um, Treasury has invested in this, NHS England has, has invested in this, and we are beginning to make progress. But it is a very uphill struggle. Um, so we've got to focus on, on that. And because, if we go to the next slide, what does this mean in terms of, of weights? Now these are people that have breast cancer, and we're just purely looking at people waiting more than 104 days. Don't ask me why we came up with 104 days, I'll ask other people that, but it's about 13 weeks. Um, but uh, you, what you can see, that this starts in uh, 2015, uh, it was very low, it was only, only about half a percent um, were waiting that, that length of time, um, up, up till about 2018. Things started going off a bit at that point, and then the red line is the, the pandemic, um, and you can see how much things have got worse. And that really is very worrying for patients, and not only is it worrying for patients, it does actually have an impact on survival rates. And that's breast cancer. That's, uh, if we look at the next one, this is lower GI colorectal cancer, where the, the numbers you can see even before um, the, the pandemic were considerably higher. If you look at the scale on the right, it was between four and five percent of the waiting uh, that that uh, that long, um, and then it's gone absolutely haywire since. since. So we've really got a problem, and we haven't cracked yet in terms of uh, of cancer. So I'm going to conclude here. I've got the next slide, if I may. Um, I hope, probably didn't need to convince anybody in this room, but I hope I've convinced everybody that William Marsden was a truly great man, and the fact is, I think he's the only person who has founded two uh, major hospitals in London. And if he was alive today, he would be very pleased about the progress that's been made. I'm sure he would welcome the fact that we have a national health service that is free at the point of, of delivery, but I am equally sure that from what we've seen about his character, he will be pressing us to go a lot further and a lot faster. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sir Mike, for your um, wonderful lecture and insights. <coughs> so um, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Liz Reardon, who is an international speaker, broadcaster, and award-winning author. Liz uh, was a breast cancer surgeon at Ipswich Hospital, uh, when at the age of 40, she was diagnosed with uh, breast cancer. She started to formally write and talk about her experiences, leading her to be nominated for a Women of the Year Award in 2016. She's co-authored The Complete Guide to Breast Cancer, How to Feel Empowered and Take Control with Professor Trish Green. And in 2020, she launched her podcast, Don't Ignore the Elephant, discussing things no one else talks about. And I'm really looking forward not only to her lecture tonight, but also to a copy of her next book, Under the Knife, The Rise and Fall of a Female Surgeon, which is just about to be.
thank you, um, everyone in the room and everyone online. It's an honour to be asked to talk to you today. And I think to really understand what cancer is about, you have to walk a mile in a patient's shoes. Now, I could walk a mile in the shoes I'm wearing, but I, I've seen cancer from every side. I've been a breast cancer surgeon, I've been a breast cancer patient, and now I'm caring for my own mum who's got cancer. And it's amazing how much you don't know until it affects you personally. But I want to start with my journey as a cancer surgeon. What drew me to it? And I remember to the day I was in a sixth form where you could do work experience, and we were shipped off to the local hospital told stand at to the back, don't touch anything, stay away. And there was a colorectal surgeon removing a bowel cancer and they lifted it out of the abdomen and I could see the bowel wriggling and glistening and I thought, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> Two rugby lads hit the floor behind me. <laughs> but I was like, this is what I need to do. This is magic. Just that, this is amazing. Medicine bored me. I didn't want to do one hour ward rounds talking about tinkering drugs. I wanted to cut stuff out and make people better. And I remember the first time I found a bowel cancer in a patient, I was examining him and my registrar was watching me. I went, oh! <laughs> because I found a lump. I thought, oh God, the patient knows I found something. Forget that. But that excitement of this is amazing. This is what it feels like. Cancer's a really funny thing. When I was training, you didn't say the secret. It was neoplasm, or lump, or malignancy. And I remember doing a ward round, and my junior doctor had said, it's been a really bad day, you've had a load of prostate cancers come in. So my registrar and I went around with a KY jelly and a glove, so PRing every patient. That's a normal prostate. That's a normal prostate. That's a normal prostate. They didn't realise what was normal or not, because it really was see one, do one, teach one. But I loved being able to talk to a patient and examine them and work out what was wrong and then take them to theatre before the days of everyone going through the CT scanner and see if I was right. But it was really hard because I was a woman in a man's world and the sexual harassment and the bullying were right. I didn't, walk, I didn't work for another woman until I was 13 years into my training. I didn't work for another woman and it was really, really hard. At the time, you didn't whistle blow because you needed a job. If I told my consultant off for brushing his knuckle against my breast, he wouldn't let me operate for the next six months and I needed to learn my craft. And it was really, really hard. Now, when I did urology, um, my maiden name was Ball. That was how I was known as Miss Ball. And I was introduced as Tess, as in testicle. And that was my name and it stuck for two years and that's what I was called. It's actually quite funny because my other colleague was um, a guy called Richard. So there was Dr. Dick and Dr. Ball. And I'd introduced myself to Ben, I was examining. And in, I remember one clinic in Caffili, I used to go off to do an erectile dysfunction clinic. And my job was to show men how to melt a wax pellet they put down the penis to get an erection. That wasn't in a lecture in medical school. But I remember sitting in this little room waiting for the next patient to come in. He said, like, knock on the door. And I sat in my chair, I turned around to hold his hands, and he came in and dropped his trousers. <laughs> a bit different back then. But I loved learning the craft, and it wasn't just the craft of how to operate. And it's one thing tying a knot in your room around your big toe. It's another thing doing it with gloves that are covered in fat and blood with someone watching you and you're shaking. It's completely different. But it was about the communication. Because so much of medicine is about talking. And I remember working with one physician who would say this, um, you've not had a heart attack, as he looked at the ECG upside down, you'll be fine, you can go home. And I'd have to go back with the nurse and say, you have had a heart attack, you do need to stay in. I remember a cardiologist speaking to a gentleman saying, you've got three problems. You drink, you smoke, and you're pregnant. Mm -hmm. And that was his way of telling him that he needed to lose weight. But then I remember an amazing geriatrician who was speaking to someone with Parkinson's and ankylosing spondylitis. He was sat like this. And this man was six foot four, my boss, and he sat on the floor so he could make eye contact with the patient and talk to him. And I thought, wow, this is really what being a doctor is about. But it, it, I was always going to wear pyjamas. It was all about surgery. 
And I got drawn to breast surgery, mainly for the lifestyle actually, because there's no one called. And my patients go home the same day, and I don't have ward rounds, and I can have a life. But it's dressmaking and tailoring. Every breast is different. And I get to talk and develop a relationship with my patients. And I tell you, there is nothing like the power of walking to an operating theatre knowing you've examined a woman, you found a lump. I'm going to take it out. I'm going to hide the scar. No one will know what I've done. And when it goes well, it's like a drug. Grey's Anatomy was right. That feeling of, God, I'm good, that was amazing. It's a high. Everything you've learned works. And you see the woman flash you in a supermarket two weeks later because she's so happy with the scar. <laughs> it's incredible. I love my job. But operating only took up a tenth of my week. I had a half-day list, and I shared a joy list every three weeks because you develop more doctors, but the hospital stays the same. You don't get more operating lists for us to work. And a lot of my time was spent in clinics. And most of my time in clinics was either telling women they had breast pain and how to deal with it, but on a Friday, it was double mass. And the morning would be spent telling women that their biopsies had shown cancer, and the afternoon would be spent telling women that they needed chemotherapy or the cancer would come back. And I felt like I was being paid to break women, to make them cry, to absorb their emotion, the anger, the guilt, the husbands wanting to punch me, the women fainting, all of that. No break. Ten women a day. And you're meant to go home on a Friday afternoon and be, hi, how are you? And I spoke to a physiotherapist at a conference and he asked me, well, how do you cope? Surely you get coaching or counselling. I signed up for it. It's part of the job. I do this. No one helps, no one asks. This is what people who deal with cancer do. And I do wonder whether we look after the healthcare professionals who deal with this day in, day out, to help them cope with all this emotion that we absorb. You become numb to it. It's just another cancer. But you get the old case that makes you cry in the toilet, the woman who's pregnant with metastatic cancer. It's really, really hard. I didn't get that until I was a consultant, until I was the one responsible for breaking someone and operating on her. Because as a trainee, it's just a patient, you never see them again. And I had no idea how hard my life was going to be as a breast consultant. And after only 18 months of working, that job nearly killed me. Because I got suicidal depression twice with the stress of having to do this for a living and that guilt that I couldn't cope with my job. I didn't know who to talk to, I didn't know where to go, it was really hard. I only thought I could take a month of sick leave, I didn't realise that I was entitled to six months. No one talked to me about this. And I can't tell people because that if it gets out, no one wants to be seen by the crazy doctor. There's still that huge stigma about talking about mental health, and I only do it now that I'm retired. But I took the tablets, and I had the therapy, and I went back to work because the sooner than I should, because my patients needed me. And then I became a patient myself. It was 2015, and I was 40, and I was a fit, healthy triathlete. And I just thought I had a breast cyst. Hands up if you examine yourselves or check yourselves every month. Put your hands up in the room. Look around and see how many of you check your breasts, your testicles, your pee, your poo. It's not many, maybe about 5% for those of you online. I never did, because I'm a breast surgeon. I'm not going to get breast cancer. I thought it was a cyst, and I have expert hands. My mammogram was normal. And I had an ultrasound scan, and the, the radiologist did the scan, and I looked at the screen, because I do them myself, and I saw a cancer. I didn't need to wait for the drip feed of information that most patients get. Biopsy result. Surgery result. In that split second, I knew I'll need chemo, I'll need a mastectomy, I've got a good idea whether I'll be alive in 10 years or not. And how much of that do I tell my parents? It was almost, I'm still in denial, it's too much to take in. And I had every single treatment I give my patients, and I realised how little I knew. 
Because I used to tell patients, you'll lose your hair during chemo. No idea you lost all your hair. <laughs> Bed bugs come in the night and strip your leg hair. And your pubes go, I had no idea. And a third of my patients have chemo. I'm embarrassed to say I used to tell my patients, radiotherapy is a bit like an x-ray and you might feel a bit tired. God, I was wrong. But I've never heard my radiotherapists talk to patients because I was in another room. But 80% of my patients had radiotherapy. I had never seen a radiotherapy machine. I had no idea my patients had to get their arms above their head and that's why the shoulder exercises are so important. I'd never heard it, it's ridiculous. I discovered what it was like to be on the receiving end of breaking bad news. Now, the first time I found out I had cancer, I knew. I got to tell my mum, I'll be calling you in 10 days to tell you I've got cancer. No, you won't, yes I will. I had chemo first. It was a large stage three cancer to try and shrink it down and it worked, it had disappeared. I had a mastectomy and I remember sitting in the waiting room to get my post-op results. It was the 23rd of December. And I, would, I dressed up, I tried to draw on my eyebrows, and I remember being surrounded by couples, squeezing their partner's hand, looking at the floor, not wanting to make eye contact. And I thought, thank God, I never need to be in their shoes again. And my surgeon told me, there was 13 centimetres of cancer left in my breast, and two of my lymph nodes were positive. I didn't know my breasts were that big. But that was bad news, and I wasn't expecting it. And I knew what it meant. My husband was like, what does she say? And I'm like, yeah, I'll need more of this, I need more radiotherapy. My chance of survival's just got a hell of a lot worse. I wanted to run out that room, screaming and shouting and swearing. But no, because you have to sit and be examined and go through the next operation, and then you have to do the walk of shame past all the other couples in the waiting room until you finally get out of the hospital. Why don't we have secret exits into gardens where you can go and just get yourself together before you have to drive home? Goodness knows how people who found out alone during COVID got home. I don't know how my husband did it. It's really, really hard. As a patient, you pick up on the smallest detail. And some of you may have heard this before, but one of my mum's friends was diagnosed with breast cancer and she was sat waiting to find out. People coming out of this side of the clinic were smiling People coming out of this side of the clinic were crying. And she got called to that door. Now maybe it's good she was given an idea of what was coming, but you pick up on the smallest things. And I realized words have a huge impact. I've seen the best and the worst of breast cancer. And I would say, you know, it's lucky we caught it early and it's good that it hasn't spread. But no one's lucky to get cancer. And no cancer is good to have. It's an earth-shattering thing to hear. And I'm trying to, you know, it's fine. It's just a bit of this, a bit of that. And I used to tell women who were going to have an abdominal reconstruction, it's a bit like a tummy tuck and a boob job. How bloody insensitive was I? I had no idea because I hadn't been in their shoes. Now, I had nine months of treatment. Chemotherapy, surgery, radiotherapy, and... When I was discharged, when they said, see you in five years, it was the worst bit of my life. Because I was alone, thinking, is this a cough or a cough? Trying to go back to work, when my own hospital told me I was only entitled to four weeks phase return to full-time working. And I said, hang on, I've had my own cancer. But we can't give you any more because that's like favoritism. Three weeks of Googling led me to find out, and I'm going to say something, I want you to put your hands up if you know it. Did you know that if you've had cancer, you are legally disabled for life? Put your hands up if you knew that. Look around the room, that's again about 5%. You are legally disabled, which means your employer has to make reasonable adjustments under the Equality Act, or they are discriminating against you. It was only when I went to my line manager and said, I have rights with, oh, okay. Let's backtrack and let's give you a six month way to go back. I didn't know that. Patients are getting sat, they're losing their jobs because they don't know they have rights. I discovered how hard it is to deal with an instant menopause. I never talked to any of my patients about sex, ever, all the way through my training. I'd have to go and tell men having a bowel cancer that they might get a retrograde ejaculation or might not get an erection. I never told them what to do about it. 
When I discovered an instant menopause, the loss of libido, the vaginal dryness, the pain, paper cuts when I'm cycling in my labia, but why am I not talking about this to patients? Who do I go to for help? And I went to speak at my own hospital's grand round, three years after my diagnosis, and I was talking about this. And this woman at the back put her hand up and said, well, I'm the sexual counsellor for cancer patients. No idea she existed. Your sex life is touched by every single illness and we don't talk about it. I had an oncology matron in her 60s who was diagnosed with tongue cancer and she said it took her five years to work out the only place she could French kiss her husband was in the shower because fake saliva was horrible. But no one had mentioned that. Why would you want to kiss someone who's had tongue radiotherapy? But to her, it was an important part of her life. And we don't talk about it. And I really think there's no point giving people the best treatments the NHS has to offer if their quality of life afterwards is ridiculous. And I didn't get that until it happened to me. The going back was really hard because I knew how much pain I could inflict on patients. I had post-mastectomy pain syndrome. I didn't want to operate. When I was breaking bad news, I wanted to say, yes, this is terrible, we'll get you through it. And I got told off. Don't make cancer be a bad thing. Because when I tell someone they have cancer, I know what's coming. I've been in the room, I've got the plan, I know. But it's fresh to that patient. And if you don't sit and hold your tongue for 10 seconds to let that news sink in, so they can then say, but what about my mum? Or who's going to look after the horses? What's really important to them? You'll never know what they need, but we steamroll over them because we've got so much to say. I sat in a multidisciplinary meeting on my first day back and I heard my team talk about a woman with cancer and she could have been me. She was 41, her cancer was 12 centimetres, she had three lymph nodes, I had two, and everyone in the room went, Pfft. they swore, that's not good. They can't know they're talking about me because they have to be able to talk openly because if they're treading on eggshells, they can't do their job. But for me as a patient, who do I go to? We know a lot of our staff are gonna have cancer and they're dealing with cancer patients. And I really think we need to talk about how we look after our staff and how we help them when they are dealing with their own issues. Now in 2018, um, I had a local regional recurrence. Again, expert hands, I didn't know. I had a nodule on my chest wall I'd been having physiotherapy for, and I was planning to go flat to have my implant removed, and an ultrasound showed it was a three centimetre recurrence. I didn't know. And I knew that meant my chance of being alive in 10 years was even worse. And I had to go through the stress of getting a second opinion. Do you find someone to tell you what you want to hear or what you need to hear? It's really, really hard. But the side effects of treatment meant that I couldn't operate. I can't get my left arm above my head, I couldn't operate, psychologically I couldn't cope. So at 43, I lost my career. The one thing I spent my life training to do for 20 years was taken away by the illness I was learning to treat. COVID was great though because it was scrubbing up. I said, yes, I can pretend I'm operating, this is really good. But it was really hard because I couldn't remember my last operation. And I do wonder though, if I'd known it was my last operation, would I have done something different? But what it made me realise is that I was the world's most boring dinner party guest. <laughs> because my life for 20 years had been eat, train, exams, jobs, audits. I had no life outside of surgery. And I realised what's my purpose. They said, go and do something you're passionate about. I remember my mother-in-law saying she married her husband, who used to be a prophet at the Middlesex, for breakfast and dinner. Not much. But like, how do you fill the days? What do you do? And I realised... I just want to help people, as cliched as it is. So I started writing, and I started talking about what it's like being a doctor who's had cancer. And I'm embarrassed to say, I had never been on a breast cancer patient's forum. I don't need to know, I'm too busy learning about chemo. I had no idea what questions people were asking. Where do you go for information? So this is an interesting question. If any of you were diagnosed with cancer, is the first website you would go to, the Royal Free, hands up. Nobody for those online. The NHS website, one or two. Your GP's website, nobody. Google, most of the room. The first, and I used to tell patients, don't go to Google because it's scary. It's the first place I went. That's where patients go for information and you'd be amazed 
by the things they find online. Patients asking, is it safe to have sex during chemotherapy because I'm scared I'll make my husband's hair fall out? <laughs> and if you are treating patients and you are not looking at the questions they really want to know, you can't really help them. And that's why I do what I do, to try and reach the gap between medicine and patients. It's coming up to four years since I had my second cancer and I'm starting to breathe again and thinking, you know, maybe I will be alive in 10 years. And then my mum broke her arm, which led to it being amputated for an osteosarcoma. And I felt guilty that I hadn't known the swelling she'd had before was a cancer because it's so rare. And she's incredible. My mum is the one-armed bandit on Twitter. She is incredible. We are dealing with this with humour. It's amazing. She can put on earrings with her left arm. I challenge any woman and man in the room to put on lipstick, earrings and a necklace using your wrong hand. It's incredible. But I discovered how hard it is to be a carer, especially an educated carer that probably annoys the doctors I'm seeing. But it, when it's rare, 150 people a day are diagnosed with breast cancer, 150 people a year are diagnosed with osteosarcoma. There's nothing to Google. It doesn't get research or funding or media attention, and I have no control. But I've seen how hard it is for elderly patients to work the system. When it's an app which keeps pinging, messages here, messages there, and you've got to do this and you've got to do that, and she gets missed. I know who to ring, I know what to say, but when you don't have that knowledge, and my worry is the people who are good, honest is the wrong word, the people who sit at home and wait their turn because they don't want to bother are being lost by the system. And the people educated like me, they know what to do, they're getting the treatment they need, maybe they're not the people who need it first. And there's a real discrepancy with how we are treating everybody equally. It's also made me reflect on what might happen to me. If my cancer comes back, am I going to see what might happen to me through my mum? And it's been really, really hard. But I think what I've come to realise through all of this, and I didn't get it as a surgeon, because as a surgeon to me, high quality care was doing the right thing at the right time. But that's only two parts of quality. The third is the patient experience. You can't measure it. You don't get money for doing it well. And it's a bit like TripAdvisor. The people who hate you complain. Most of the people think you're great but can't be bothered to tell you. And maybe one person will get you flowers at Easter. You don't know what it's like. But patients are people. And it's their experience both in and out of hospital that really, really matters. We need to make sure they are living and living well and having fun and laughter and just learning to be themselves. It's why I exercise, it's why I sew, because in those moments, I'm just Liz. I'm not a cancer patient, I have my identity again. And I think it's so important to consider the patient as a whole because why is any of this important? I think we all need to remember that we could all be patients ourselves one day. Thank you. Good evening everyone, I'm John Spires, I'm the Chief Executive of the Royal Free Charity um, and on behalf of the charity and the Trust, an enormous thank you to both of our speakers for two insightful, heartfelt, challenging speeches. Um, I think we spanned 200 years, we went all the way back to the 1850s uh, or, or earlier than that. We spanned the, the scientific and clinical through to the intensely personal and thank you in particular Liz Kerr for sharing what I can only imagine must have been so very difficult um, to us about your experience. Um, we have a very, very brief moment for questions. Um, I think probably a maximum of two questions. I've got um, roving microphones that the team are ready and armed with. So what I might um, do is take two questions in a row and then ask, us, ask our speakers to come back up and do their best to respond to those. I've got one hand up at the back there. Any more questions? One hand up next to you with the first two. You get the, you get the two questions. Over to you. Thank you both for fantastic lectures. Um, I, I really wanted to make the point, following from what you've said, that a lot of the solutions are that we don't spend enough money on health overall. We spend a lot less than most European countries, and but what we do is pretty efficient. But surely that means that doctors and healthcare professionals have to be political as well as other things, and actually push for more money being spent for health overall. It's not just cancer. Cancer is important, but there are lots of other areas where we're really deficient. Thank you. 
Okay, the next question, and I'll come back to you. Hi, Liz. Hi, Liz. Um, I'm in on Twitter. Um, I was going to say, I am a patient, and that is, I'm the chair of the disability network at the Royal Free. Um, and the patient experience this staff experience is huge. Do you think the NHS is covering it at the moment, and how can we move forward? Because my experience and what I'm hearing from patients is we're not, um, not just in cancer, um, outside of cancer as well, and any ways we think we could help the patient experience. Do you want to start here so that the yeah. cameras can see you? In, in no particular order, as you, as you see it. Do you the first one? <laughs> <laughs> the question is Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I think both questions together. I think the, the NHS is facing the hardest time that I have known in my quite long career. Um, and yes, we are struggling. We are struggling because we have had austerity for God knows how long now. And we have then had a pandemic, and we've got staff who are really exhausted. But I think people are still doing an extremely good job as far as they can. But are patients suffering from it? I think you could see the waiting times that I showed on um, the breast cancer and GI cancer, and it could be true for other things as well uh, beyond cancer. Uh, it is a real, real struggle. Um, Will we get through it? I very much hope so. I don't think there's an alternative to getting through it. I think we've got to get through it. Um, and I think we need to, to push for that. Do we need more money? I would love to have more money. Do, do I think that we can do better with what we've got? Of course we can do better. I mean, there's, there's, there's never a, a, a case where you couldn't be more efficient. But I, I still do think we need more money. Um, and I think we can point to particular aspects of that the health service where we definitely need and I would say that's just as true for social care as it is for, for, for hospital care because we know that, I suspect this is true for the Royal Free because if it's not, it's the only hospital in the country that it isn't true for, um, that, 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 that you know, there are a lot of patients in beds in our hospitals at the moment who don't need to be in a hospital bed. They need care, but they don't need to be in a hospital bed. And then if we could only have them managed somewhere else, then we could also get the problem in AME better, we can get the problem um, with ambulances better, all of that. So it's a real struggle. But there are people, some of them in this room of course, who are absolutely working flat out to try and make that better. I think we need more money, we're not going to get it. But one of the things we could do is exercise. I think it should be the first cancer treatment. It can halve the risk of it coming back, it can halve the risk if you get it. And most doctors have no idea about the exercise and college of science because you don't have time to go to those conferences. How do we stop it being a dirty word? Because I'm sure everyone in this room is doing their three aerobic sessions and two weight training sessions a week. Yes, <laughs> all these nods. I think I used to get 10 minutes to tell someone they had cancer. 10 minutes to go through breast cancer, tell me about your medical history, examine you, do you want to reconstruction? You might, it's not, we don't have the time. I think what we should be doing is digitally signposting and saying, right, you're going to go online. This is where you can get the help. This is where you can get the evidence you need. This is where you find out. Because no one has the time to do everything. The patients want it at different times. But by digitally signposting them to books, apps, websites, forums that patients have already found, that would really help them stop them getting lost and actually getting sensible information rather than Dr. Google. Thank you very much. Um, so, thank you again to both of our wonderful speakers for um, a genuinely enlightening and fascinating evening. Um, we've put a spotlight on cancer care, um, both from the population health perspective, but also um, really crucially the experience of patients, and I'm very pleased we were able to do that. As Gillian said earlier, the Royal Free London is one of London's largest um, cancer care providers, and as the charity that exists to support the Royal Free London, we are committed to supporting their recovery from the pandemic and helping to tackle the challenges presented by rising cases of cancer in our communities. As many of you will know, we have a, an appeal which is live right now, raising money specifically focused on improving cancer diagnosis, treatment and the patient experience here at the Royal Free. The funding that we are generating through this appeal is going to support projects which will speed up lung cancer and breast cancer diagnosis, getting treat patients onto treatment pathways as quickly as possible. And we also want to test 
new immersive experiences using virtual reality headsets for patients going through the traumas of chemotherapy. Um, there's information about that appeal in the packs on your seats. If you're joining us online, you can visit our website or use the QR code that's on the screen now. Um, the time is ticking away. We are on a countdown to midday tomorrow when the window for the matched funding that we've very generously been granted by several donors will close. As we started this lecture, we were just shy of £300,000. It would be lovely if by midday tomorrow we could have got to three hundred twenty or even £325,000. So please do consider doing what you can sharing the message about the appeal, and if you can, giving yourself, we'd be very, very grateful indeed. Thank you, as always, to everybody who's joined us online. It's been a wonderful evening. I hope you've learned something. I certainly think in the room we're all going to be left with an awful lot to think about. Um, that's the end of this evening's lecture. Thank you very much for coming, and thank you very much to those online who joined us.